Good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to this session. I am honored to present to you two distinguished guests from the Republic of Montenegro, the Minister of Finance and Social Welfare, Mr. Spych, and the Minister of Economic Development, Mr. Milatovic. They will talk to us first about the tourism within this very difficult period of the pandemic, and then about the EU accession and how it matters for the stability of the region. So, Ministers, welcome to Athens and welcome to Delphi Economic Forum. I will start with Minister Milatovic with my first two questions. And the first question is, having in mind that tourism is very important for the economy of Montenegro, what are your expectations this season? What lessons have you learned from the last year experience and how well are you prepared for the upcoming season? My second question, which is related to the first one, is how well is the process of vaccination going in Montenegro? What is the number of vaccinated people on this date? The floor is yours. Thank you very much. Uh, yes, you are very much right. Uh, tourism in Montenegro is very important. Uh, it accounts for about 25% uh, of our economic activity. And uh, due to the COVID and uh, due to the pandemic, uh, the sector obviously dropped last year uh, tremendously. Uh, actually, the, the drop uh, in 2020 uh, was uh, at about 85% in comparison to the one that we had in 2000, uh, to the level that we had in 2019, which was a record year uh, for tourism activity. Uh, <clears throat> there are several reasons, obviously, for you know, a significant drop, such as 85%, mm -hmm. which the country experienced last year. And, uh, and uh, just you know, to give you a perspective, the two neighboring countries, Croatia and Albania, had a drop of about 50%. So uh, the question is uh, you know, why, why the drop was you know, so much uh, bigger in Montenegro. And one of the answers, uh, you know, obviously a part of the pandemic, was uh, a management of the borders. So basically the former government uh, in Montenegro, which uh, you know, then lost uh, the elections in, uh, at the late of August, basically kind of you know, closed the borders vis-a-vis uh, -vis some of our most important uh, markets, such as Serbia and Bosnia and Herzegovina. And uh, this amplified the drop of, of tourism. Uh, there are basically three important markets for Montenegro. The first one is the region, so the countries of the Western Balkans. And they account for about 40% of the tourism activity in the country. Uh, Russia is also an important uh, market for Montenegro, uh, as well as the EU. So Russia accounts for about 25%, and then the EU accounts uh, for about 30-35% uh, in total. So uh, the lessons that we learned from the last year is obviously, uh, you know, better management of the borders. One of the first things uh, that, uh, that uh, we've done uh, when we, you know, uh, when we as, uh, as the new government uh, were put in place was really kind of you know, to open up the borders vis-a-vis uh, -vis the countries in the region. Mm -hmm. So uh, all the countries in the Western Balkans, there is now a free movement of people within the region of the Western Balkans. This is also fully in line with, uh, with uh, you know, the hope to create a regional economic area in the Western Balkans as one of the important parallel things to the EU accession of all the countries. So that's, that's one thing. And, you know, that's obvious, you know, helping the, the tourists to come, you know, in an easier way in Montenegro from the countries in the region. And this is why, uh, you know, that's one of the reasons why we as the government uh, for 2021 are hoping to have uh, tourism at the level of 60% of the one we had in 2019. Naturally, uh, with the better you know, control of the borders, uh, the process of vaccination in the country has been uh, speeded up, especially in the last uh, one month. Uh, last week, actually, the country was uh, uh, a world recorder in the number of uh, people we vaccinated for a day. So uh, I think it was for two or three days that uh, we were able to vaccinate 1.5% mm -hmm. of our population on a daily basis. Mm -hmm. uh, so the overall number of people that uh, have been so far vaccinated is about 20%. Uh, 
with the aim to, you know, to, to, to speed up the things uh, in the next one month as well. The supply of the vaccines uh, is, uh, is enough you know, for this to be achieved. And, uh, and the government is doing uh, you know, most of its efforts towards that aim. Uh, the third you know, very important thing is uh, you know, this is going to be the second year in which the tourism activity is happening within the context of COVID. Mm -hmm. And this is why you know, uh, the, the so-called health protocols uh, are very important. Uh, what we did as the government, uh, we, uh, uh, we uh, you know, put an additional effort to, you know, to, to promote health protocols, to even you know, make them better to those that, you know, that we had last summer. Uh, and you know, that's important not only because, you know, so that our tourists you know, feel uh, you know, kind of uh, secure in Montenegro, but also you know, for the workers in the tourism sector to be educated properly how to, how to behave in you know, different situations. So these three things are really kind of you know, crucial for this summer season to be much better than the one we had last year. So, uh, you know, control of the, of, the, of the borders, so management of the borders in a smarter way than we had last year, you know, vaccination and the, and the protocols. And as I said, we are hoping, uh, you know, for this year to have the tourism at the level of 60% uh, we had uh, in 2019. Obviously, you know, this is going to be depending on the epidemiological situation. We also have some good news when it comes to that. Uh, I think that uh, in the last uh, about two months, we had uh, you know, a very positive trend. So the overall number of active cases uh, that we have at this day in Montenegro is very, is very low. So I think that we have only about 1,400 people who are currently active cases in Montenegro with, you know, with a further uh, positive, positive, positive trend. So I think you know, these are all uh, kind of good reasons why we believe that the, we will have a much better situation than what we had last year. However, you know, we should never forget that uh, this, is, this is another year in which the tourism sector is happening within the COVID context. And uh, the only way you know, to go out of this situation is obviously vaccination. Thank you very much for your answer. So it is obvious that from what you told us, you let us know Montenegro is a safe destination for tourists. Could you tell us a little more about the health protocols? So the health protocols uh, is something that uh, we really, you know, put a strong emphasis this year. Uh, as I said, you know, they're important uh, for, you know, the workers who are working in the tourism industry, but also, you know, as a signal for everybody who comes to Montenegro that, uh, that you know, that uh, they, you know, should really be considering Montenegro as a safe destination. One important uh, message, uh, you know, that, uh, that uh, we as the government decided uh, to convey uh, through the protocols is that all the tourists uh, who come to Montenegro would be taken care, uh, you know, by our public, uh, public health system mm -hmm. uh, for free in case they, uh, you know, I'm knocking on the, on the wood in case they, they get COVID. Uh, however, you know, what we've seen last year is that not that many tourists uh, actually, you know, uh, got COVID. So, uh, so we are hoping, you know, to have a similar situation this year. But, you know, even in case uh, they, you know, they, uh, they get it, uh, we thought about it. Uh, and, you know, they're going to be cared for free by the public health sector of the country. Thank you very much. And I have a last question related to tourism. Uh, Montenegro recently announced that uh, its new national airline, Air Montenegro, is starting to operate from June. So what are the planned destinations for the first flights? So as I said, uh, the new government of Montenegro, which, uh, you know, in a historic uh, change of power in the country, uh, was put in place in, uh, in uh, December last year, inherited a number of uh, poorly run state-owned enterprises. Mm -hmm. Among those, uh, there was a, a, a former national flag carrier of Montenegro, Montenegro Airlines, which was a company really poorly run. Uh, and uh, and uh, you know, one of the things that, uh, that we did in order to kind of, you know, save the company, uh, which uh, we couldn't do otherwise because, you know, we had the, the, the EU state A rules that were stopping us to kind of, you know, to be further saving the company, we uh, decided to create a new one and really kind of, you know, to transfer all the know-how from the former one to the new one 
to run it uh, in a more meaningful and business-oriented uh, manner. So this is why we hired uh, a number of professionals who we brought uh, from abroad who are now running the new company. And as, as you said, we are hoping the new company uh, would start flying uh, by the 1st of June. And some of the first destinations uh, would be somehow aligned uh, to some of the most important tourist uh, markets for Montenegro, you know, including Belgrade in Serbia, Frankfurt in Germany, Ljubljana in Slovenia. Thank you very much for your answers. If I Please, may add of course, on, of course, on this point, of course. Uh, Montenegro was uh, previously, often in the past, we had a situation where we were theoretically pro-European, and we had all all kinds of best words about how mm -hmm. how much we want to uh, how much we want to join EU. But in facts, uh, or in the way that we were, we were acting, uh, not always we were we were acting in such a manner. So. Uh, but this government is actually changing uh, that and taking uh, EU accession extremely seriously. And that's one of the best examples because it was very painful for us that the state-owned enterprise called Montenegro Airlines that existed before for many years, and it was like a cornerstone of Montenegrin tourism. It was like a national brand and pretty famous. You know, we, we didn't want, as a government, we, we took a decision that we won't go against our own legislation. We won't go against the Chapter 8 that we signed with the European Union and that we would honor our obligations towards the, the Brussels, and we, we didn't give illegal state aid to that company. So that company was a struggling company even before COVID, obviously, and as you know that the Brussels, and also our own legislation forbids such a state aid, uh, and would deem it as an illegal. So it's, it's, a, it's a good example how we are gonna tackle the issues of uh, malfunct malfunctioning uh, uh, state-owned enterprises. We see a good example in, in Greece with uh, HCAP that we mm -hmm. have formed like uh, maybe five, six years ago. And that's an example that we want to follow as well in Montenegro. Thank you very much for your comment. Now we'll pass to the second part of our session, which is the EU accession. And I will ask my first question to you. Uh, Minister Spaich, the accession negotiation to the EU have started more than eight years ago. How is the new government going to speed up that process? And what are your expectations? So I think it was a really good introduction, uh, your previous question and my previous answer. But uh, Montenegro was already uh, negotiating for eight years, which is Correct. if we don't take into account Turkey with its political issues. Uh, we had the only other country that was negotiating so long was Croatia. Mm -hmm. And Croatia was accepted after uh, eight years. And Montenegro is still, uh, we, we have, opened all the th 33 chapters, but uh, we are nowhere near closing them. And uh, basically, although we are first in line, in EU accession line from the Western Balkan countries, we are still, uh, we still have a lot of work to do on that. And we, you know, the, the, just to cut it short, like uh, we have to do the things, walk the talk, uh, talk, uh, mm -hmm. walk rather than the talk. So it's really important that Montenegro now focuses on execu execution and implementation all of, all of these rules and uh, laws that we have taken in the past. So, uh, and uh, if we can judge by the beginning, by the situation with the national airline carrier, we can uh, easily see that Montenegro is ready to take some tough decisions that are necessary for our EU accession. Uh, obviously, it's not only on the economic side, we need to, uh, rule of law is an extremely important field uh, for, for Montenegro, we, we, have, we are working very hard on that point as well. Our uh, colleague ministers from, from Ministry of Justice, Justice. Ministry, uh, Police Minister, etc., Interior Minister is also uh, doing an amazing job on that. And uh, we expect that it's going to be a base for us to, for a speedier accession. We want the accession to, uh, to be much faster than, uh, mm -hmm. than, uh, than uh, judged by some of the commentators or like analysts. We believe uh, within the, uh, gov this government's mandate, we can be ready to join it's EU. It's a fresh government, a new government, so exactly. there's enough With, time. Exactly. I mean, what, what, what is important uh, yes, you know, to, the, to, the, to the process of the EU accession is really, you know, we also inherited uh, an economy which is, which, is, which is not really a European economy. And, uh, and uh, you know, for instance, let me give you an example. Most of the FDIs in the country are not really European. They usually come from, you know, from, uh, from the countries that are, that are not members of the EU. Uh, China is you know, building uh, the, the infrastructure in the country. Mm -hmm. uh, the government owns 20% uh, of, uh, of its public debt to China. Uh, so I think that you know, we also have to work a lot 
uh, in the next you know, few years, aside from all the structural reforms that we need to do, you know, aside from enhancement of the rule of law, we also need really kind of, you know, and I think you know, this forum is a great opportunity for us to pitch Montenegro to credible EU investors Correct. You know, so that they help us also tilt the economy a bit towards the EU, so that uh, once we become an EU member, we really become an, a functional EU member, so that we align the economic structure of the economy, you know, with uh, with the, with the functional political membership. I think you know that's important. So there are so many uh, things uh, that you know that uh, need to be done, and uh, as uh, as the Minister of Finance said, really kind of the the, the aim of the government is. Uh, to prepare the country to be ready for the EU accession by the end of the mandate of this government. So in the next four years, to be ready to do our homework. And, uh, and I think you know, this, is, this is something which is clearly being promoted by the prime minister, by you know, the whole government. This is something which is you know, fully supported by the Montenegrin people. About 80% of people in Montenegro uh, support EU accession. And I think, you know, on the other side, also from Brussels, we are getting uh, some credible signals that, you know, that uh, naturally, if we do our own homework, Montenegro will be the next, uh, the next country to join the EU. We hope. Thank you for your comments. I have another question for you related sure. to the accession. We will talk a little bit about investment. So sure. my next question is, where do you see the biggest investment potential in the upcoming period? What Montenegro has to offer to the new investors? As Minister Milatovic has uh, nicely mentioned that uh, most of the investments in the, in the past have, have previously been from the other regions, not EU regions. And what we like, our aim is to attract more EU money into Montenegro. Mm -hmm. uh, we have infrastructure as every developing country. We, uh, we need to build our infrastructure to, for a speedier uh, delivery of goods and services. Uh, obviously, like the highways are very mm -hmm. important uh, for Montenegro. We have a highway from Bar to, to Belgrade. That's like a, it's like a backbone of the economy. Another one is Adriatic Union Highway, uh, which we are talking now with our European partners on, on, on them. Uh, we have also uh, the energy sector that's, uh, exactly. that's pretty this thriving and electric. I think that's probably Tell the most interesting. Tell us something more about the energy and the green economies. Exactly. So Montenegro is taking uh, the, uh, the agenda of uh, green and digital extremely seriously now, and especially in the energy sector. It's very relevant. We have a tremendous capacity of, uh, of producing electricity, as well as the means to export that electricity further. Mm -hmm. Uh, we are very well connected regionally. However, we are also very well connected to the main EU market, such as Italy, mm -hmm. uh, by the undersea cable. So we can export the sur surplus capability, uh, electric uh, uh, electric power to the Italy, mm -hmm. and the price obviously is much higher in, the, in that part of the EU, and uh, the investors can. Especially during this period. Exactly, and investors can arbitrage. From it. Correct. Exactly. So these are like two main opportunities, but also uh, IT sector is uh, in Montenegro is booming, and we have the highest growth in experts we see. Uh, it's growing every year, like by, by ridiculous That's rates. That's very impressive. We yes, know that. we yes. have, I mean, like as most of the Eastern European nations, we have very good engineering schools and our mm -hmm. people are yeah. highest literacies in the world, probably. And we have a good base, HR base. Uh, and uh, now we need to tap into that. We need like, uh, we need the capable entrepreneurs. We need the uh, uh, investors who can recognize that. Obviously, for uh, bringing the investors to Montenegro, um, my ministry, Ministry of Finance, is working hard to, to create a, a good environment, especially in the fiscal sense. That's one of the most important things for, for the investors, I would guess. And obviously, uh, the legal side of the things. So uh, we are preparing like a package that's going to go like in a couple of months uh, to welcome investors in, in, a, in, a, in a very fiscal friendly way. Great. Any comment, uh, Minister Minatovic, before I, think, I pass my last question? You, because I, this is a very hot issue, the I investment. Think, so I think, I think you know, as, uh, as, uh, as the Minister of Finance said, you know, apart all, all the development projects you know, in the energy sector, in the tourism sector, in uh, IT sector, uh, there is a big potential in agriculture as well. Mm -hmm. I think that you know, that's, that's the sector that we are thinking kind of, you know, it should be connected a bit better with our tourism sector. Uh, so the backward linkages, you know, from the tourism sector to our agriculture is a potential which uh, hasn't been used, uh, you know, fully in Montenegro. Very interesting point. Please tell so us. So that's, you know, that's something which, you know, which I'm sure, uh, you know, it's a, it's a, it's a focus here in, in Greece as Correct. well. 
uh, you know, because the demand is there. The demand comes, you know, often from the tourists. You know, for instance, uh, Montenegro is a tiny country of about 600,000 people, but uh, on an on a annual you know, basis uh, in a normal times, for instance, you know, in 2019, uh, there is about 2.5 million tourists who come to the country. So, uh, and that's obviously a big demand that, uh, that uh, we could, uh, you know, we could uh, use fully to its potential. Uh, you know, apart all the developmental projects, uh, you know, it is really needed, uh, you know, for the government to pursue, you know, credibly and really vigorously all the structural reforms that are needed. And that's where the EU accession kind of, you know, really comes to its place because EU accession for us, it's a strong external anchor which help us to kind of, you know, to do the things right. uh, that are, you know, promoting the growth, you know, regarding the you know, innovative policies, labor market policies, you know, fiscal thing uh, that, uh, that the minister said, uh, and everything else which is really needed, you know, for a sustainable economic growth, which is, uh, you know, something uh, which is competitive, inclusive, and green. Uh, and that's, you know, that's, that's kind of, you know, the highway that we, that we see and that we kind of, you know, follow. And as your prime minister said this morning, there is no other option is the EU accession, which is very important for all of us to understand. And I think, you know, on that one, I think Montenegro is also a good example for the others, because, you know, uh, Montenegro is a sort of a, a small country which uh, can perhaps, you know, uh, speed up the things and change the things, uh, you know, in a, in, a, in a speedier manner in comparison to the others. But I think, you know, our example can also be a good one for the region as a whole, that, uh, that the only future for, you know, for us and the, for the whole region is really the EU accession. Because you know, without uh, the region of the Western Balkans, Europe would never be you know, a full story uh, in, its, in its essence, in a sense. Thank you very much for your comment. And now we'll pass to my last question to you, sure. uh, Minister uh, Spijic. Um, Montenegro, uh, but there is a large interest in Montenegro of the foreign media for the Chinese highway credit. Mm -hmm. Can you tell us more details about this issue? Absolutely. I mean, we, we have, not knowing even the, the last question, we, we have already kind of answered it, that uh, it's not about, it, for us it's not a geopolitical problem, it's purely economical problem and it's not even uh, that big as, as the media is maybe sometimes trying mm -hmm. to portray it, but basically a lack of EU involvement is causing that kind of, uh, that kind of discrepancies that we have. We are, we are NATO member, we are soon to be EU member, but we have Could investors and that? creditors yes. <laughs> coming out from other countries. But it's difficult to explain because it was done in the previous government's uh, uh, capacity, so um, it's also not clear to us to the fullest extent, frankly spoken. Mm -hmm. uh, but uh, one, one thing that is for sure is that we have spoken with the Minister of Finance of Greece, for example. And uh, that's where the EU comes into very, at its fullest and it's the best. Uh, e you know, Greece has a debt GDP percentage that's maybe even higher than Montenegro. However, its debt is deemed as fully sustainable and uh, as, as witnessed by the credit rating agencies, etc. Mm -hmm. And the reason for that is, there are various reasons, of course, that Greece is much bigger and more diversified economy, but what's important is that maturities of the debt, of the Greek debt, is they're pushed way back. And also cost of funding for the Greek debt is much smaller than Montenegro's. So uh, that's one of the things that's, uh, that's also a huge tangible benefit of the EU in the terms of financing, it's finance, infra, financing infrastructure, financing other important things for the country. And you know, like the Montenegrin uh, debt to GDP for the, from the, coming from this uh, particular project is maybe 15, uh, a little bit more than that percent of the GDP. So it's not a massive, it's not an extremely you know, uh, significant one, but it's significant because the maturity is coming this July. And Correct. we are starting to repay. Correct. And uh, you know, it's although the the highway is still, still not finished, the construction company still haven't hasn't finished the highway. But the the uh, the, the lender is requiring us to pay on time. So that's something that is obviously there are some discrepancies like that. We are negotiating now with uh, our Chinese. Uh, counterparts and uh, we see the openness to resolve these kind of issues but the, the whole point is that the EU presence is extremely important in connecting Montenegro in EU economically 
first. And also, when I say EU, it's, you know, EU is a story of not only connecting Montenegro with uh, Germany, Montenegro with uh, France, but it's regional integration, connecting Montenegro with Greece, with uh, other Western Balkan countries, with Croatia, etc. So that's what's important. So, ministers, I have to thank you very much for your presence and for this very nice discussion. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank ladies you very and much. gentlemen, thank you very much for being with us at this session.